in here. Hello, everyone. In case you missed us last week, I am Johnny Wilson, the editor-in-chief of Computer Gaming World. And it's been my privilege to chat with Roberta Williams, the co-founder of Sierra Online, designer of the award-winning King's Quest series. And we've been talking about some of the adventure games past and present and the just-released King's Quest Mask of Eternity. And tonight we're joined by composer extraordinaire and Roberta's creative co-conspirator on King's Quest Mask of Eternity, Mark Siebert. It's my pleasure to be with you both. Thanks, Johnny. Hi, John. I'm hoping it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, last week, uh, we talked a little bit about the history of adventure games, and then we turned the questions over to callers on the phone, but they didn't really get involved until the uh, second hour. This week, uh, we want to talk a little bit more about the way the series evolved and a lot about Daventry and the dimension of death in, uh, in Mask of Eternity, and we plan to uh, give away uh, some of the toughest uh, solutions to uh, puzzles. We plan to share some of the bizarre things you can do with Connor and reveal some of the Easter eggs, those weird, unexpected surprises in the game. But before we go on that Easter egg hunt, we want to get people involved uh, in this uh, program right away. And we want to get them involved by uh, having them participate in a poll. So right away, we're going to ask uh, what you think about Roberta Williams's games. And uh, then Roberta's going to tell us uh, what her answer is uh, to this question we're going to poll you on. And that is, you know, out of these five games, which one of these is your favorite Roberta Williams game? Oh, excuse me, I beg your pardon. Uh, this is the one, <laughs> which one of these five is your favorite Roberta Williams character? We're going to do the games later on. And the first uh, Roberta Williams character, so the first one is King Graham, Princess Rosella, Adrian Delaney, Connor of Daventry, or Laura Bow. So uh, we want you to be able to, uh, to vote right now using the poll. Meanwhile, uh, while they're polling, let's... Uh, Let's talk just a moment. Uh, we were talking about uh, King's Quest V last week before we opened the phone line. About the time that King's Quest V was being done, Mark was involved in some other projects in Sierra. For example, shortly after serving as music director on King's Quest IV with that amazing score we heard last week, you won uh, Computer Gaming World Special Award for Sound Achievement for Space Quest III. That's right. Now, um, what was so difficult about uh, doing sound uh, in that period of time? Oh, gosh. Um... Uh, I think on Space Quest 3, the thing that uh, we had the most difficulty with was just trying to get um, sounds that would fit the um, uh, space uh, canvas. Um, the uh, tools that we had back at the time uh, came with uh, set instruments that were um, very traditional in nature, you know, uh, strings and horns and things. So we had to pretty much just um, oh, uh, make up all of our own instruments and, and sound effects within the uh, units themselves. Yeah, um, so basically that was because there were only three boards uh, available at that time, that Kovacs thing and uh, the uh, AdLib and uh, the MT32. From MT32, Poland. right. Now, uh, that was great stuff. I'll never forget my first experience of playing Astro Chicken in <laughs> Space Quest 3. Uh, now, you uh, collaborated with somebody on that. Uh, who was that? That was uh, Bob Stevenberg. He was the uh, drummer from Super Tramp. And uh, how did that collaboration, uh, you know, work? Did you have some of that uh, snobby uh, rock star stuff? Uh, no, Bob is uh, was a great guy to work with, and uh, in fact, we we got along so well that uh, later he uh, did an album project, and I ended up working with him on that as well. Oh wow, well that's great. Well, uh, hey, it looks like the poll answers are beginning to come through, Roberta. Uh huh. Uh, uh, surprised in any regard? Oh, let me think. Oh, see, oh, I just got a private chat message in the way here. Okay. Uh, Hmm. So it looks like King Graham. Looks like he's out front there, huh? Well, uh, that's how that's definitely. working. I think it's kind of hard for me to read this because I, I, at one time I saw uh, Laura at 100 percent. Yeah. And I saw King Graham at 100 percent, and I saw Adrian at 50, and now I've got 50-50 between Connor and Graham. So I, do I. I'm not quite sure how to read this either. Wow, we may have to wait a little longer. Yeah, maybe it's, <laughs> it might be that it's still working its way through. That could be. Yeah. Could be. Uh, well, I, think I know we'll... there was a lot of support for Graham and a lot of support for Laura out there uh, in the chat room. Uh-huh. Well, I'm surprised at the, at the support for Laura Bow. That's such an old game. Well, that's right, but I think uh, people uh, identified with her. You know, uh, After all, you said uh, she was the it girl. Uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Well, and who was I... the it? And who is the real it girl? That was uh, Clara Bow. Clara Bow. And uh, because she was supposed to have whatever it was that made her extra special. Yeah. So uh, that was pretty terrific. 
she well, had uh, since we don't seem to be getting the poll results, uh, maybe we can get these people involved with some trivia. In fact, uh, maybe we can get them involved with some Space Quest trivia and, uh, and bring Mark back into the chat here. Okay. So uh, in this plan, we're going to have you answer uh, this trivia question by being the first one in the chat room to type in the correct answer to the following trivia question. Now, this trivia question goes like this. In the manual, oh, and this one you're going to get the Space Quest anthology if we can find one. Uh, if, not, <laughs> if not, you'll get mass of easy, but, This will uh, be a contest for Sierra people to find a Space Quest anthology. <laughs> that's true. That's right. So in the manual to Space Quest 3, an alien family is told by their father that they're going to flea butt for their annual vacation. But which of the following worlds was where the alien offspring wanted to go? Did they want to go to Disneyland, Bear's Nazi Farm, Andromeda, Roberta Land, or Skywalker Ranch? Let's see, the answers are coming in. I hmm. see Andromeda. Andromeda. Oh, a lot of Andromeda. 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 I see a lot of Andromedas. Yeah, a lot. But yeah, there's, how many, there's Jack, Roberta Land. That's one I see as the winner. <laughs> how many people have Duck actually played this game? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That's We're, my favorite game, too, Guess 667. <laughs> no, well, no, it's my second favorite game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, yes, the uh, the correct answer was uh, Roberta Land, and I believe that Studman Jack was the first one to uh, get the correct answer. Studman we'll, Jack. We'll check with hey. the uh, board op and, uh, and make sure of that. Roberta, uh, prior to the release of King's Quest V, there were uh, two other companies that were trying to close the gap uh, of Sierra's dominance in adventure games. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was uh, LucasArts with uh, Maniac Mansion in 1988 and its sequel, Zack McCracken. Right. And Accolade with Search for the King. And they both had really nice graphics, and they both really thought that they were gaining on you. But um, the uh, LucasArts games used what we called a reverse parser, where you picked the, the subject of a word down at the bottom and connected it with a command. Right. And Search for the King had the same kind of command line that everybody had used before that, you know, mm -hmm. go here or get this. But all of a sudden, you did something very different in King's Quest V, and, and what was that? Well, yeah, I, what, what they were searching for was to try to make it easier to communicate with the adventure games at that time. Um, the parser, if anybody doesn't know what a parser is, that's essentially a way of communicating with an adventure game through your keyboard by typing in, uh, simple sentences, uh, very simple sentences. And, uh, and so you as a designer would have to figure out what words or what, what, uh, forms of sentences people would try to type in. And then you try to think of all the synonyms for words you could to make it as easy for people to, to communicate with the game. But, um, as more and more people were beginning to buy computers around that time, which was probably around 1989, 1990, somewhere around there, uh, uh, personal computers were really starting to take off. More and more people were beginning to buy them. And um, as a result, people weren't as comfortable with the keyboard and as typing in and spelling as, as people were earlier. So various companies were trying to figure out ways to make advent adventure games a little more accessible and play. Um, obviously, that was one of their ways of doing it. What I decided to do was to have the icon bar idea, which was basically to take the was to take the basic ideas of of what you really needed to um, to have an adventure game um, in order to still be an adventure game, to be an interactive story, and to be able to solve puzzles and, and things like that, and this distill it down to the basic moves you really needed to be able to make. And uh, and then add pictures or icons or but buttons on screen in some way in order to be able to do that. And I distilled down the ideas that obviously you need to be able to walk if you're a third-person perspective game. Um, you need to be able to do do something, the actions. Um, you need to be able to talk to other characters, and you needed to be able to look at different items around you. Um, in order to get descriptions or clues or story points. And you needed to um, be able to, to have inventory. You needed to be able to get objects and be able to use objects. And then, of course, save and restore and that kind of thing. But um, so I distilled it down to those, and I made up little little icons for those. Walking was a little guy walking. Doing was a hand. Talking was a word balloon. Looking was an eye. An inventory object was like a, um, a an inventory bag or purse. 
And uh, and we created an icon bar, which was at the top of the screen for King's Quest V, but it was it was always hidden behind the picture. In order to bring up your icon bar, you would move your you you would have your cursor around on the screen. You'd move with your mouse, and um, well, obviously, well that's a big part of it. Actually, is taking it from the keyboard to the mouse, which I didn't which I neglected to say, so that the cursor would be doing a lot of the work, and the cursor would be changing its look depending on which of those little buttons you'd press. If you pr- press on a walk, then it would turn into a little guy walking or feet or something. And if you turn, uh, you know, if you press the hand or the do, it'd turn into hand. And, and the cursor would change its look according to what it was doing. And um, and so I decided that it would be easier to have people play and to be able to more instantly get into the game and be able to play it. And uh, you proved to be right, but it was uh, quite controversial uh, as it was. We're going to do one more chat-based trivia, and we're going to do it over the next break, and it involves Mark. Mark, uh, about the time that uh, KQ5 was being worked on, weren't you scoring Castle of Dr. Brain? Yes, that's right. Well, uh, the first person who types in uh, the right answer to uh, this question uh, can actually uh, win a uh, signed copy of King's Quest Mask of Eternity, signed by both of you this week. Whoa. The top secret decoder grid mm-hmm. and the castle of Dr. Brain used two different kinds of symbology, astronomical symbols and another kind of symbols. What was that symbol? Hmm, I don't know if I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. Do you know the answer, Mark? <laughs> Maybe somebody out there is real smart. Okay, <laughs> so go ahead and type that in in the chat room while we go to a break. <laughs> oh, my God, what a mess. Johnson, what do you make of all this? Well, Sarge, years ago, when I worked security down at the zoo, there was this ornithologist. Orna? A bird doctor. Mm. Anyway, it seems he was fooling around with genetics. Penguin genetics. Splicing and mutating, mutating and hybriding, hybriding and... Well, some said he even wore frilly little dresses. Anyway, one night I walked into his lab, and it looked an awful lot like this. The peanut butter smeared windows, the cute little sock puppets, even the meatloaf crammed in every single faucet. If you ask me, I'd say it was the work of one of those beer-happy penguins he was messing around with. They're evil. Evil, I tell you. And they will never, ever... Johnson, get a grip. You're saying a penguin did all this? That is the stupidest, most ridiculous... ID. Suspect heading north on the 704. Please advise. Yeah, and I'll bet he's short, bald, and has cute little flippers. How'd you know, Sarge? Over. Drink broad ice, but uh, beware of the penguins. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. So you're visiting San Francisco from London, and you're taking a lot of pictures. Because we're here on holiday, we've got about six films, and thought we'd just get a lot of snapshots. So it's pretty sunny out here in the pier right now. And then, of course, if you go into the aquarium here, it gets real dark. Yeah. So you have to give some thought to film speed. No, I'll just buy a postcard on the way out. (laughs) You ought to try Kodak Max, Kodak's maximum versatility film. One film for sunlight or low light, stills or fast action. Now, doesn't that make sense? Yeah. Think of the money you would have saved on postcards if you had this film. I mean, because you wouldn't have to buy the postcards after every place you go, because you know the picture came out. Okay, well, think about it. I bet I take a picture of you while I'm here. Okay, but since you're not using Kodak Max, maybe you ought to buy the postcard. <laughs> <laughs> Kodak Max, it's all you need to know about film. Forget F-stops. Forget exposure times. For that matter, you can forget your camera, too, and pick up a Kodak Max one-time use camera instead. Take it anywhere. It's loaded with Kodak Max film, so no matter where you go, you'll always get the shot. Kodak, take pictures further. What's up? It's Heineken seeking the truth. So open a Heineken, wait for the beat, and let the truth pour out. Hey, Heineken. My friends have this dog named Killer. Big, mean sucker. They had to lock him in the bedroom whenever I went over. So I'm there one day, and he got out. And man, he came after me like I don't know what. So I, I jumped up and spilled my Heineken all over myself. I was so scared. Well, instead of biting my face off, he licked the beer off my hand. Now, whenever I go over there, he wags his tail and he licks my hand, and, you know, I, I guess he expects me to taste like Heineken. The truth is, a dog will never bite the hand that feeds him. And remember, if you have something to say, call 1 800 44 Red Star, open a Heineken, and let the truth pour out. Brew truth since 1886. Seek the truth. Heineken USA, White Plains, New York. Hello, 
Johnny Wilson from Computer Gaming World Magazine talking with Roberta Williams and Mark Siebert. Congratulations to KKNAI for getting the correct answer. They were biological symbols mixed with the astronomical symbol. And uh, we're very excited about that. So, Roberta, two years later, we noticed that everybody was moving toward uh, iconic interfaces and uh, it proved that uh, you were right in making it more accessible. Mm -hmm. But uh, did you get a lot of hate mail at the time? Um, I Yeah, I'd say I, I did get some hate mail, but I think most of the hate mail, well, I don't want to say hate mail. I mean, that sounds pretty strong. Um, but the, the, the mail where people were not happy um, was before it, it, the game came out. A lot of people found out about it. You know, I was talking about it in the various uh, computer magazines and, and stuff um, about how I was changing to a, more of an icon bar idea. And a lot of the, the fans of King's Quest and, and the Sierra Adventure games in general uh, weren't, weren't happy. I think they thought that I was taking away a, a real critical part of the game, whereas I was sort of thinking of the, the parser interface as, as just a means of communicating with the game. I think a lot of people were thinking of it as actually um, a real life a part of playing the game, that they would use the parser, use talking to the game as part of the puzzle process and being able to really talk to it. And and I can understand that. I really do. Um, I myself, as you know, am, a, a, am an adventure game player. I started as an adventure game player. And I love the parser. I, I really do. I, I, I did. But I also had to be realistic that it, I just did not feel that the adventure game genre was going to survive if we kept it as a parsered game. Yes, you, you told me you were even uh, trying to, to reach your mother with that uh, iconic parser. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I was trying to figure out. I, w I would watch my mother. Uh, my mother... I don't even know if today, even to this day, she's actually ever played one of my games. I, I'm very angry with her about that. <laughs> but, you know, so I've been trying to get her to play my games. And I would watch her with my older games trying to, you know, I'd sit her down at my computer and I'd say, just type in this word or that word. And it would just be so excruciating because she would tr be trying to find the right key on the keyboard. And then she would be typing so slow, or she, you know, or she wouldn't get the word spelled quite quite right, or she wouldn't quite understand the right way the sentence should be typed in, just so. And and you know, and I'd be there trying to tell her, but it was just excruciating to watch. And you could tell that she wasn't seeing the fun in this. You know, she just wasn't understanding it. So, so I think that was. But but I've seen other people with that also. And and I it just I was saying to myself. This just isn't going to make the big time if we're if we're still doing this. And yeah, I had her in my mind, but even even with that, I still didn't get her to play King's Quest V. <laughs> right. So, uh, Mark, when did you move over from being uh, music director uh, for Sierra in general to really uh, producing and collaborating on these uh, King's Quest games? Uh, well, my first uh, role as producer was King's Quest VII, um, but I had been a uh, producer on a couple other projects before that, uh, a couple smaller projects. Well, King's Quest Seven is one of those controversial King's Quests as well, uh, you know, because the animation made a lot of people think it was uh, uh, more kiddie-like uh, mm -hmm. than uh, than the other King's Quest games had been. Um, uh, how do you feel about uh, King's Quest Seven looking back? Well, I I, I like King's Quest Seven. Um, my kids loved it. Um, we we kind of set out to do a, a very uh, Disney-like uh, kind of game, a very family. Um, you know, happy uh, uh, kind of game where you could sit and uh, and play with the with the kids and stuff like that. And I, I think we did a good job uh, for uh, the goal that we set. The, the animation was uh, was absolutely incredible. Uh, were you just using Sierra artists, or were you actually uh, using animation studios too? Well, uh, the Sierra artists um, did all of the um, keyframes, and then we sent them out uh, of house to uh, several different houses, and they did uh, a lot of the tweening and uh, some of the uh, animation that itself. Right. Um, I believe you said there was actually more than one animation house? Uh, yeah, we had uh, a house in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, of all places. Well, that uh, sounds scary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did you ever have to smuggle out any cells? Uh, no, I actually, I got to uh, take a trip over there and see their house. It was quite interesting. Um, and we had a, a house in uh, South Carolina and also one in New York. And uh, you uh, continued to work with the one in New York, I understand. Yeah, they ended up doing a, a really great job on King's Quest and uh, later used them on uh, Torrance Passage and on Larry 7 as well. 
Hey, Mark, didn't we have one in Bosnia, too, an animation house? Oh, you're right. Uh, yeah, we uh, did work with um, a group in uh, Croatia. Yeah, Croatia, but it wasn't it around the time when Croatia was in was breaking away from Yugoslavia or something. Uh, yes, strange. there was all kinds of funny inside jokes that we won't share about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. No, but yeah, um, uh, and they they did a really good job for us too. Right. Well, uh, some of the folks in the chat room are uh, are complaining about the animation on King's Quest Seven and complaining that it was choppy. Was it the animation that was choppy, or was it the technology at the time? Well, I, I think. Um, I guess it's it's hard to hard to say. Um, on King's Quest Eight, we we definitely um, uh, took the uh, system requirements and uh, raised them high to make sure that people had a really uh, good experience. On uh, King's Quest Seven, I think the uh, system requirements that we set for the uh, for the game were were probably uh, stretching it, and and just um, I think some people ran it on systems that were just not capable of uh, making it do what it needed to do. But if you take the game and you play it on a, a good machine. Uh, uh, today it looks uh, it's it's a pretty game. I think though that maybe part of the problem um, was, and and I do think the animation is a lot better than than some people might be giving it credit for. Um, might be though that the fact that we had different houses that were animation houses that were working on it, and and so the consistency wasn't always quite there. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, it was a nightmare. You probably would have uh, given uh, Mark enough frequent flyer miles to uh, be one of the first moon passengers <laughs> and able to coordinate all this. Uh, yeah, it was perfect. it was very difficult to coordinate. So you've uh, taken a lot of risks in the uh, in the King's Quest series uh, over the years, and and both of you were very instrumental in the decision to go to 3D and in, in Mask of Eternity. So so what was the point? What did you gain out of uh, 3D? Well, um, I I decided um, that I was going to go that King's Quest was going to go 3D while I was working on Phantasmagoria, and that was in uh, that was around 1994, uh, maybe 95, somewhere around there, um, and it was around the time when Doom came out, and it was just it just made a splash. I mean, everybody was playing Doom, and and it just be and then other other 3D games were were beginning to come out at that time too. Um, and it just became clear that computer games were going to be going 3D. And I just pretty much made up my mind during uh, the development of Phantasmagoria. I knew I was going to be, going to be doing the next King's Quest. And, uh, and so I, I knew, that being the ace in a series, I mean, that's tough, you know, to, to give a designer and, you know, and say, you know, you're going to be the eighth in the series, and it's got to be bigger and better than ever, you know, and you got to keep this thing going, and it's got to be great, and it's got to be all these things. I mean, it's, it's really tough to do that. And I, I, to, to, in all honesty, it's much easier to work on a brand new game that nobody's ever seen before, that nobody ever knows about, because then you can do anything. I mean, this, the sky's the limit. But to try to do something that's the eighth in a series is really not easy. And um, so to me... Um, to go 3D was was it. I mean, we had to do that. And also, I Mark and I entertained the idea of making it uh, multiplayer also. But uh, that was mixed. I mean, it was just like, well, we're doing 3D, and that's enough, you know, for now. Maybe multiplayer later. You have any comments on this, Mark? Yeah, I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you think you would lose the most if it had been done in, say, the uh, KQ7 style? Uh, I think the ambiance. Uh, I, I think the, the game just has a, a, a wonderful um, a mood to it. It's it's um, kind of uh, dark and mysterious, and um, uh, the the look of the screens and the music and the sound effects just I, I think uh, make for a, a wonderful experience. Um, I don't think you could have gotten uh, the same experience from uh, you know cartoon animation. I'm just now uh, getting into the the Davendry portion of the game, and uh, and already I can tell you that um, the old King's Quest uh, seemed claustrophobic in comparison. This really feels big as you wander around. Are the maps actually bigger? Uh, the the maps are huge, and um, that in combination with the way the interface works, um, uh, the interface on on this game is just uh, I think is is very new and fresh, and it and it takes um you know a few minutes to really. Uh, Get a get a grasp on it, but, but once you once you are able to handle uh, the movement and the camera and stuff, uh, all of a sudden you you just feel that you could do and look at anything. You know, it's just it's it's very open. 
Okay, that's uh, that's pretty cool. The one question that was bothering me was I, I was wondering, does uh, Mask of Eternity really use the same uh, three space three D engine as Red Baron two in the in the Dynamics game? Well, uh, yeah, we started with the engine from Red Baron, but we have pretty much um, uh, left only the uh, rendering portion of it for the software engine. Uh, pretty much everything else uh, we rewrote up here at uh, at our location. Okay. Well, we had some technical difficulties with the first poll, uh, but uh, it looks uh, to uh, our technicians as though King Graham won. And um, I guess that's not surprising, uh, Sir Graham, uh, you know, being so uh, important in the first King's Quest and being the continuity all the way through. Uh, but uh, now we're going to give people a chance to uh, participate in a second poll. Uh, and uh, this one is about uh, which is your favorite Roberta Williams game. So uh, this one is going to give you a choice between King's Quest One, King's Quest Four, King's Quest Mask of Eternity, Phantasmagoria, and the Colonel's Bequest. So see, we'll see how this one happens. I'm voting. I'm voting as we speak. <laughs> oh, excellent. Okay, here we go. And that must be why Phantasmagoria is Yeah. It's <laughs> quite easy to see which one I like. Well, I'm uh, counteracting your Phantasmagoria here. Oh. <laughs> what did you do, Mark? Oh, always the most recent one. Oh, the most recent one. <laughs> oh, that's true. Oh, well, of course. Of course you choose that one. Well, that would have been, yeah, that would have been my second. You actually should have put the next game on here so that we can all vote for yeah, your next game. Nine. <laughs> oh, by the way, you never asked me which was my favorite um, character. Yeah, which was your favorite character? My favorite character was Adrian Delaney in Phantasmagoria. Okay. Now, you think uh, she's your strongest female character, or is Laura Bow the strongest female character? Boy, that, that, that's really difficult. I, I, I think Adrian Delaney was stronger. Yeah, I, as a character, I do feel that she was more developed. Right. Well, it looks like they're trying to follow your lead here, you know. Phantasmagoria is uh, beginning to pull ahead here. Oh, now you guys, so you vote what you really think. Don't follow me. <laughs> <laughs> do, what you, do what you really think. Well, um, King's Quest uh, Mask of Eternity is uh, a little low right now. Maybe that's because a lot of people don't have it yet. We're going to give them a chance to win a copy in a few minutes. And uh, also that may be because uh, some of them feel a little controversial about combat. I saw some complaints about combat in the chat room. So uh, uh -oh. why don't uh, one of you explain why you decided to include combat in Mask of Eternity? Well, actually, I think this should be a two-part answer. I think I should answer, and I think Mark should answer Sounds good separately. To me. So... Um, the reason why combat was, was added, and, and first of all, I, I don't think that people should take it negatively because combat is definitely is, can be part of a story. A lot of people think combat, that's just, that's just an action game, it's just action. Um, but if you think of, about some of the great movies that have been out there, some of the great books where combat is part of it, if you think in terms of adding it to the story and that it fits very well with the story, then I think it's I think it's very appropriate. And my my idea was I wanted to do a story that was more like in the old tradition of the epic games, where you ha you had your true hero that would go out and I mean, I mean think about some of the old legendary figures of uh, King Arthur or Sir Lancelot or um, Jason and the Golden Fleece. I mean, they, they were all superheroes that would go out and they would fight the monsters and they would, um, you know, they were, they were working for good. And, um, and really also, if you sort of think about the quest, I mean, quest is like a quest for faith, a quest for even your inner self. And, and it could be said that fighting the monsters is the same as fighting your own inner demons. Um, but when you think in terms of putting it into the story, you're fighting chaos and, uh, and you're trying to set order right and you're, um, you're fighting evil, I think it's very appropriate. I mean, how would Star Wars be without Luke Skywalker out there fighting the bad guys? I think it would definitely be missing something. Mark? Um, well, when we started working on the project, um, uh, we first uh, designed uh, Daventry and uh, ended up with this huge map and uh, Connor wandering around this big area with pretty much nothing to do in between the puzzles. And um, that, in, in connection with uh, Roberta's story, I started uh, recommending, uh, you know, let's add some other things like combat and health items and things like that to, to give us um, more things to fill up the world and to um, keep the player involved in between the puzzles. And so we, we came up with this very uh, simplistic 
uh, combat system that um, I don't think uh, gets in the way of the story. It's, it's a very um, easy to grasp, you know, uh, click on the guy until he's dead kind of, um, you know, uh, Diablo-like uh, combat, and I, I felt it really added to the system. Well, uh, that's good. What are the biggest differences between the easy and the difficult levels in, in handling combat? Um, well, I, it's it's pretty basic. The, the, the monsters are um, uh, just would take less wax to kill them. Um, the AI gets a little um, uh, less uh, intelligent sometimes, um, but for the most part, it, it's um, uh, mostly Connor hits harder, and, and they don't hit as hard. Okay, well, great. Well, we're getting about ready to, to go to a break. We're going to give a, a different way for people to participate in trying to win that signed copy of King's Quest Mask of Eternity. We're going to ask another trivia question, and this time we're going to take the fourth caller. So write down this number in case you don't have it. It's 1-800-485-1923. And the fourth caller is going to get the first chance to answer the following question. That's one 800 485 Three, and the trivia contest question is, what college did Laura Bow attend? Is it William & Mary, Brown University, Tulane University, Yale University, Stanford University, or Cambridge University? Which college did Laura Bow attend? When we get back from break, we're going to talk to the fourth caller. Colin, you guys. I want to talk to you. for Corona beer. Let's start with an exciting sporting event. One that doesn't include monster trucks. Now batting number 28. Good. Cold beer here. Get your cold beer. Oh, we'll have to fix that. Cold Corona here. Get your cold Corona here. That's better. Ice cream. While we're at it, let's make every vendor a Corona vendor. And then, instead of an organ, how about a steel drum? Uh, these hard wooden seats gotta go. Let's turn them in the hammer. Yeah, go. Ah, go team, go. A relaxing day at the old ballpark with plenty of cool, crisp Corona beer. Today's Fuzzy Cap Day. Free Fuzzy Cap for everyone. We can do better than that. Today's Foot Massage Day. Free Foot Massages for everyone. Very relaxing day at the old ballpark. A little on the left there, Fifi. Oh, yeah, man. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Corona beer. Change your latitude. Imported by Barton Beer, Chicago, Illinois. How many of us actually listen to our cars? What are they trying to tell us? Let's slow them down electronically. Stopping and going is hurting me. My driver stops for no reason. You guessed correctly. Your car really hates stop and go driving. Stop and go driving can really wear on it. Stop and go, stop and go. One or the other, please. 
We recommend you protect against stop-and-go driving with Pennzoil Motor Oil. Pennzoil is formulated to protect your car's engine against tough driving conditions. Now, let's pour a quart of Pennzoil into an engine and listen more closely. Thank you. Thank you. Stop. Go. Pennzoil. Hi, I'm Johnny Wilson, Editor-in-Chief of Computer Gaming World Magazine, and uh, we're talking to Roberta Williams, the designer of King's Quest, Phantasmagoria, and a dozen other games that define the graphic adventure genre, and Mark Siebert, award-winning music director at Sierra and the producer of King's Quest Max of Eternity, as well as co-designer. Uh, Mark, Roberta, could you uh, tell us about some of the worlds that uh, you'll explore in uh, Mask of Eternity and uh, why you built them the way you did? For, for instance, let's start at Daventry. Do either of you have a, a favorite spot there? Um, yeah, well, my favorite spot is uh, there's a place where you can get inside the castle Daventry. And uh, it's the, the the dining room and the throne room where um, you can get you can see the the, the pictures of King, of King Graham and Queen Valenice, and then also the magic mirror, which is um, you know which reminds me of the older games. So that's my favorite place. Yeah, I, I like the pictures of uh, Graham and Valenice in uh, the castle because we uh, actually went back to the original paintings from King's Quest V and scanned them in. That was kind of fun. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Personally, I like the um, uh, the ruins, the castle ruins, because they're uh, uh, they're kind of fun, and there's a few little tricky traps in there that are kind of fun to play with. Mm hmm And you get some good views from there, also. And there's a, a little secret place that you can find and uh, get a stash of cash. Oh, yeah, that's that right. Place. I don't uh -huh. know how many people have found that. How do you get to that secret place, Mark? Uh, well, you could try using a potion of reveal over there, and uh, you would discover an illusionary wall. Uh, I think everybody was using that uh, potion of reveal for something else. Uh, I think that it looks like nude Connor on his. <laughs> oh, there's that. Oh, there he is. Uh, there's one of those Easter eggs. Oh. Well, the nice thing about the potion of reveal is you could, uh, uh, you know, save your game, use it, and then uh, find out, you know, what you need to find out, and then uh, re you know, reload your game before you used it. Well, except there is one place where you have to use it if you want to get an object, and then you you can't save your game and use it and get the object. I mean, you can't get the object without using it. Yeah, that's true. So if you want to get the object, you, you, can't, you can't do it that way. And I always wanted to get that object, but I don't know that I want to say what that was. <laughs> Unless Johnny pulls it out of me. Uh, well, we'll warn people uh, whenever we're going to do a, a spoiler. Yeah. So, uh, so basically, uh, once again, Mark, here's the spoiler on uh, how to find the uh, secret room in the ruins. Uh, so uh, if you don't want to hear it, turn it off uh, right now for about uh, 20 seconds. Mark? Okay, uh, you go to the uh, base of the ramp, uh, go to the right of it in the castle ruins, use the potion of reveal, and you'll see an uh, invisible wall there, or an illusionary wall, and walk through, open the chest, and get yourself a bunch of cash. Excellent, excellent. And uh, now that the people are coming back, uh, uh, I noticed that some of the folks in the chat room didn't quite uh, get the idea about um, uh, getting the nude Connor, so uh, can you go through the steps on that? Yeah, um, the the new Connor thing is uh, it's uh, basically Adam and Eve. You know, uh, Connor uh, takes a bite of the apple and he turns into Newt Connor. So if you have a potion of reveal, you can go up uh, between Connor and Sarah's house and uh, use it. You'll find the apple and then uh, click on it and you get Newt Connor. <laughs> Excellent. And that's one that, that they snuck in there without me. I didn't know they did. Yeah, that. Roberta designed that in way from the get go. <laughs> I think I think uh, Mark and the programmers had a quite a bit of fun uh, behind my back. <laughs> they were all trying to make you look guilty. Yeah, and then try to blame it on me. You know, like like, like I have this sick uh, sense of humor. Well, I heard you put all the religious references in, so this is a Garden of Eden. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm well, the religious one, and they're all the, uh, well, never mind. <laughs> That's right. Uh, per interest on their part. Uh, <laughs> so speaking of these uh, these worlds uh, and the way that the arts work, um, uh, Mark, I think you had to direct the artist uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, didn't you? Were there particular artists responsible for each world, and is there uh, any uh, interesting differences in the way they work? Well, yeah, we had the uh, art team broke up into uh, basically three different groups. Uh, we had uh, the art team that was actually uh, building models 
Uh, we had the animators who were, uh, you know, getting everybody to move and walk and uh, throw things. And then we had um, two guys that uh, did nothing but um, put everything together on uh, the levels. And uh, they were basically the last people to touch anything that, uh, that happened in the game. Right. Um, and so um, how many different groups did you say you had? Uh, well, the art group was broken into three groups. Like I said, there was uh, the uh, people building the models, people animating the models, and then people putting it all together. Right. And Roberta, I noticed that the uh, the first person that Connor meets after uh, almost everyone else has turned to stone is that uh, anonymous wizard in that uh, that delightful uh, part stone, part animated uh, uh, sequence. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you give us any hints of uh, where this mage come, came from, and uh, or who he is, or yeah. well, yeah, he's a, he's a local wizard of Daventry, and uh, he lives in that house that's in the middle of the lake. Ah. That you have to climb up there, and that that's his house, and that's kind of an interesting house. Once you get there, it's got a, a couple of fun things to do, but he's. Um, He's a wizard. I mean, as you know, he saw the he, he's he knows things. I mean, wizards know things more than than regular people. And he saw that this uh, this evil magical spell was coming his way, and he tried to stop it from happening, but he just couldn't quite do it. He wasn't strong enough. But he's uh, he's sort of a local mage, and um, and he's really the one who's going to give Connor his first. Um, set of commands as to what he's to do. I mean, really, he's the, he's the one that is setting the, your your ultimate goal, which is to find the five mask pieces of the Mask of Eternity, which at the very beginning of the game, Connor and and the player has no idea what it is or where to go or where to start. And, and so he's really the one that that's beginning uh, your quest. And so you must find him. And, and well, and he gives you your magic map, too. I mean, without the magic map, this this game would be very difficult. And way too large yeah. to navigate. Yeah, and I use the uh, I use the trick of the of the raven to get to get you there um, uh, because we we didn't really want you wandering around too much without finding him. Well, you know, if you're really moving fast, sometimes you just pass that raven up. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it was hard to be patient and follow that raven. You know, you had the sense that you were supposed to, but I I passed it up on several occasions. Did you really? Yeah. You didn't follow him. <laughs> Uh, eventually. <laughs> oh, eventually. Oh, so you didn't get the hint. So when he says, whither does he fly? I mean, you didn't get the hint that yeah. maybe I should find out where he oh, flew? Definitely. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know me. I'm, I'm perverse. I have to uh, go my own route sometimes. Oh, I see. You're the re a rebellious. <laughs> rebellious <laughs> gamer. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but the well, wizard is, is very important also because uh, he's the first one that really talks about the symbology between uh, uh, the darkness uh, and the light and really explains uh, what the mask is, is all about. Um, uh, you told me some interesting things uh, in the side the other day about uh, the mask. Uh, would you like to share some of it with the uh, listeners? Yeah, well, the, the idea the idea that I, I sort of had in the back of my mind in developing this game, and it's just it's not really heavy or really fleshed out strongly. It was the idea of exploring um, spirituality a little bit. I mean, I don't want to get, like, heavy with this, but... The idea of of you know religions maybe or or uh, lightness and darkness and chaos and order and 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 why people believe the way they do and and I sort of went back to um, primitive religions and looking really at all religions and seeing what was um, some commonalities among them and yeah. one of the things that I found was that the idea of a sun god as Either the main god, or even even our, uh, you know, the god, you know, say God that we b all believe in today, has even had a lot of sun symbology with him. And so um, I looked back at uh, like Mesopotamia had uh, their their big god, you know, was the sun god, and he was shown by his symbol was an, a golden disc with wings. So if you take a look at at our mask that we have here, he's golden, and, and gold has always been symbolic of the sun uh, because it's an incorruptible and it's an incorruptible material. It always is, it's always shines, it never tarnishes, and uh, and you you can see that he he sort of has that sun look. The the rays are coming out from him. The wings above his eyes. Uh, came from the idea of that old Mesopotamian god with the, the winged disc. And uh, also the beard 
comes from the idea of the lion um, and Leo. And lions have also been associated with God, as sun god, and with suns in, in ancient religions, and also as a very powerful uh, male symbol. And so I took those um, those ideas and worked with um, a very good artist working for Sierra by the name of John Schrodes. And he, um, I gave him all those ideas and I gave him different masks he could look at and some of the symbology of various masks, ancient masks. And he came up with this and I, I just think it's a very strong symbol. I think it's a very strong symbol, too, and uh, having studied uh, some ancient Near Eastern archaeology, uh, I like the lion reference uh, also, because uh, a lot of the uh, Assyrian kings had uh, lion's paws uh, as the... uh as the bottom of their thrones. Uh, a lot of times, uh, even uh, in Israel, uh, the Lion of Judah was an important uh, uh, kingly royal concept, and uh, in Assyria as well. Right. So, uh, so I think it's pretty cool the way that uh, all that uh, blends in together, and it's uh, very interesting. Yeah, and, uh, and the, so the mask is, I mean, really, and, then the, and even the idea of the mask of eternity um, is, a, is a term that means essentially... Um, Again, it's a reference to sort of a god or, or old religions of a god. Any, it's sort of like everybody has their own vision or version of what a, your god or could be, or what it could what it could look like or stand for. And the image or the mask um, is each person's version or vision of what it could be, because um, you can never really see the face of God. Right, exactly. So uh, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, a few more characters uh, in Daventry, uh, some of the monsters that you uh, you meet early on. Uh, but uh, we're going to go to a break in a moment. But first we want to have a trivia question. And I would be very remiss if we started the next trivia question without my announcing officially that Drumsticks was the winner uh, of the last quiz, uh, recognizing that uh, Laura Bow attended Tulane University since Colonel's Bequest takes place in the swamp, so it's not surprising that uh, she was attending school in uh, New Orleans. In New Orleans, right. That's right. So uh, we have uh, another question coming up, and uh, this time we're going to take the third caller. So don't type this in the chat room. Uh, just uh, call in, and the number, once again, is uh, 1-800-485-1923. And the trivia question is this. What land... Does Crispin live in? Is it Tamir, Ludor, Daventry, Kalima, Land of the Green Isles, or Serenia? And uh, I'm going to be typing these in the chat room during the break, and we'll take the third caller and give them the first chance on the air to get that question right as we uh, go to the break even now. Hi. Yeah, I'm here to put up your CD shelf. Oh, yeah. Yeah, where would you like them? Let's see. Rock here. Yeah. Soundtrack there. Okay. Motown here. Fine. Country there. Good. Blues here. Uh huh. Metal here. Good. Zydeco there. Sounds good. And jazz in here. Why not? Honey, a little privacy, please. Amazon.com now offers 10 times more CDs than the typical music store. Everyday savings of up to 40%, pre-releases, imports, and hard-to-find titles. And you can listen to song clips right on your computer. Amazon.com. Few can resist. And Celtic, up here. Looks like I'm going to need more wood. Amazon.com. Books, music, and more. Let's try can I help you? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm moving and wanted to see about renting a trailer. What do you pull one it with? I'm just going to try to attach it to my bike. Your motorcycle? No, no, a uh, bicycle. I just need, like, a couple power bars and, like, make a few trips. No, you can't. We don't have anything that'll attach to a bicycle. You can't You can't just hitch it up there? No. Well, I mean, I could probably break something up. No, you can't pull a trailer with a bicycle. Well, if I need a power bar, I'll have enough energy. No, you cannot pull a trailer with a bicycle. Energy's not a problem, you know? No, you cannot pull it. Okay, well, I mean, I can try, right? No, you cannot try it. If I need a power bar, why can't I do that? I'm not getting on the highway or 
anything, you know? No, I mean, I'm out rich you a trailer if you're pulling it with a bicycle. Okay, you don't, you know, just trying to move, that's all. Power Bar Energy Bars, balanced nutrition for lasting energy. And now there's new Power Bar Harvest. It's a delicious fruit and whole grain bar for everyday energy. Because, hey, sometimes you just need something to get you through the day. Power Bar Harvest, energy for life's daily marathons. Available at your nearest Fred Meyer Nutrition Center store. Power on. Watch the sunrise with me. Who needs last names? There must be a quick because the earth just moved. Would you like to hear mutterings like these on a regular basis? If so, maybe you ought to try Smint. Lowering your mouth temperature up to 10 degrees, even one little smint is a super-chilled smidgen of immense power, providing a much-needed jump start to your dismal love life. Alas, you may finally dispense with the witty dialogue, show tunes around the piano, or any of your other well-worn, ill-fated pickup attempts. Now, when in a social situation, simply depress the ejection button on the top of your little blue box, pop a tiny smint triangle into your mouth, and soon, like a Venus flytrap snapping up an unwitting insect, your cool, fresh breath will start pulling in potential mates. A virtual tractor beam of love. So buy a box of smint today, and instead of hearing phrases such as table for one, you'll be hearing phrases more like oysters for two. Smint. No smint, no kiss. Also available in lemon. Welcome back. Roberta Williams is not only a pioneer in graphic adventure design, but an innovator. Mark Siebert is not only an accomplished musician and composer, but has become an extremely talented producer. I'm Johnny Wilson of Computer Gaming World Magazine. I've had the privilege of interviewing them for the last hour or so. In a few moments, we're going to give you your chance. Uh, if you call in at uh, 800-485-1923, we're going to uh, allow you to talk to either Roberta or Mark and ask questions uh, about how to solve various puzzles, uh, particularly in, in Daventry and the Dimension of Death. Uh, ask about characters that you've met, and uh, and we promise if it's a big spoiler question uh, to uh, try to give you some kind of warning first so you can uh, turn the volume down for a while. Uh, meanwhile, we should be having a, a third caller. Do we have that third caller for the trivia question? We do, and here's Mordak. Mordak. Yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, what land does Crispin live in? Yeah, it was Serenia or? Serenia. That's yeah, right. Yeah, it is exactly You're right. You're right, Mordak. Yeah, hi. Hi. Yeah, um, I wasn't really expecting to talk to you, so I don't have a question. But I just made up one right now. Oh, you want to make up a question? Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe Mr. Siebert could answer this one. Okay. Um, Mr. Siebert? Yeah, this was um, asked before, but you said that he would be able to answer it. Why did not... Why didn't Mask of Eternity support the joystick? Well, uh, when we designed the interface, uh, it had the mouse and a cursor. And uh, the only thing that we could come up with uh, for using the joystick would be to move the cursor. And we felt that uh, uh, nobody would want to try to drive a cursor around with the joystick, so we opted to just not support it. Oh. And I have another question. Uh, like a long time ago, maybe two years before, there was a video that came out for a preview of Mask of Eternity. And it said that the Swamp Witch, who's, which is all in level three, I think, is the Swamp Witch will will be able to turn into a beautiful lady and be able to um, be able to like persuade you that she's good. But that wasn't in the real game, was it? Uh, well, it was in the design at one time. <laughs> yeah, in the game, you just the Swamp. Which turned into a beautiful lady. Yeah. I don't remember that in the yeah, design. Yeah, remember in, in the design, uh, yeah, she was going to be like this uh, uh, siren. She was going to be this beautiful woman that if you followed her up into the top of the tower, she would Oh, that's uh, that right. Was that was a, Oh, that was like two designs before the design. I can't believe you remembered that. You should get I, another prize for I'll that. I'll tell you, <laughs> the fact that, that Mordak remembered that and I didn't remember that. That is amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's a fabulous piece of uh, of trivia. A little bit of trivia. That is true. 
speaking of trivia, Roberta, yeah. um, as you're uh, exploring early on in the game, uh, you run into the uh, stone statue of a woman named Julia, and uh, and Connor uh, makes the statement that Julia supported him in the past. Uh, what's the deal on that? Well, you know, she's the uh, she's the owner of the tavern, and uh, Connor's a young guy. I mean, he's he's a normal guy, and sometimes he might uh, have problems, maybe a few romantic problems here and there. And uh, town drunk? No, no, he's not the town. No, no, no. Connor is not. He came. He comes in and drinks his root beer in the tavern. Sarsaparilla. Just sarsaparilla. Um, Roy Rogers version. Of <laughs> and he talks to uh, he talks to Julia, and you know, and he. Uh, as, as you guys have probably figured out that Sarah is his girlfriend, um, and uh, sometimes they might have a few problems now and then, and, and Julia might help him out with a little advice. Well, that's, that's fine. Um, we're uh, inviting calls right now, uh, 800-485-1923. So if you need help in how to solve a puzzle, how to fight a henchman, or where the Easter eggs are, be sure and call in right now. Uh, we promise not to give spoiler answers without warning the audience first. But in the meanwhile, while we're waiting for the callers to come in, we're going to uh, go to a poll. We're going to ask you to name your favorite monster in King's Quest Mass Eternity. You're going to have your choice between the Shadow Bane, the Skeleton Commander, the Swamp Witch we just talked about, Thork, the Lord of the Frost Orcs. If anybody ever writes a novel, I want to write that one. <laughs> Thork, Lord of the Frost Orcs. And, That's uh, a good name, isn't it? Uh, Thork, the Lord of the Frost Orcs. Yeah, who came up with that one? <laughs> oh, I think I did. Uh -huh. <laughs> there you are. Well, so you all have to pay a license fee in order to write that novel. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll have the, uh, the poll up momentarily, and you'll get to vote. And we're also anxiously awaiting the callers. While well, we're waiting for the callers, uh, I've got some more questions. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to know was, uh, was it harder or easier to design some of those physical logic puzzles for, for math than it was to design the puzzles in the old days? Well, once you get used to it, it's, it's um, probably just as easy, but it, it, it's sort of getting your, your mind around the idea of designing for more physicality than before. Um, every time I've made changes to how you approach the adventure game, it, you know, you always have to sort of wrap your, your mind ab around how to do it. Um, when I used to design for uh, parsers, then a lot of the way that I would design puzzles would be based around the parser, based around um, uh, being able to communicate through sentences. Uh, then when we went to the icon bar, then I needed to uh, we, we needed to be a little more creative about designing around the idea of using inventory objects and do um, a little bit more and using visuals on the screen better. Um, and, uh, but when you get into 3D and the objects are really there in a physical form as far as the computer is concerned and, and you can rotate the camera and look all around it. You can go behind it. Objects are inside of them and look up and climb up and climb down. Um, they could have a solidity to them, um, so you're able to you're just able to manipulate objects uh, much more in a physical way, and it it does require you to think differently as a designer. And I can't say that it was easy at first. I think uh, I, I think I might have stated at one time that um, three designs were done for this game, and the third one was the one that finally stuck. And I think part of the problem was um, figuring out exactly what to do with, with 3D and physicality with adventure games. Mark, do you have anything more to add? Um, no, I think it's, uh, you know, as we're going through the, the puzzle design, I mean, it's just always trying to keep in mind, uh, you know, what can we do uh, in 3D that uh, couldn't be done in 2D? How do, we, how do we really make this a 3D adventure? Yeah, I think a, a good example might be uh, there's one puzzle where we, there's a, there's a mill house that's uh, actually it's like a, it's, it's a mill house and it has a water wheel that's on the river and uh, so you walk along the river and you can see the water wheel is turning and it's being turned by the water in the stream and you go inside the mill house and there's a turning stone millstone 
and it's it, and it's turning and turning. It's a big millstone, and up above the millstone is a loft where you can see that there's a rope and hook that you want to, you know you want to get it because Connor mentions he'd like to be able to get it. So, but the only obvious way to be able to get that rope and hook is by jumping onto that millstone and then jumping up again. But every time he tries, he gets knocked off by this turning millstone. So he needs to think of a way to stop the millstone from turning. Now, actually, I'm going to be going into a spoiler here a little bit, so maybe I should announce that. If Good anybody job. doesn't want to hear the answer to this, then then turn down your sound for about 20 seconds. Uh, okay. Um, so anyway, you're looking around and you know you want to get that that uh, that rope and hook, and you try jumping, you can't do that. It's, there doesn't seem to be any other way inside the mill house of being able to get up there. So you go outside, you look around, you can walk all the way around this this mill house. You can walk up and down the stream. Uh, you can even walk up to that turning water wheel and get thrown, you know, off uh, into the water. But then you notice there's this tree, and if you click on it, you get sort of a look message, and he says, oh, it looks like it's leaning over the over the river. Um, so you can use, you can get a, a, an axe at some point in the game, and you, he actually chops it down, which causes the tree to fall, and it falls across the river, and it dams it up, and of course it stops the river from from flowing, which stops the water wheel, which stops the millstone inside. So now you can jump up on it without being knocked off by this turning millstone and get your rope and hook. That's just a, an example of using more physicality when it comes to puzzles. Well, actually, just when you're designing any puzzles, uh, you know, what do you what do you do first? Uh, well, uh, boy, any puzzles. Um, story first. Yeah, sto- I, I think uh, to design puzzles, I, I do think that puzzles come a little bit later. I mean, the very first thing you need to do is you need your um, you need you need your quest, you need your goal, you need to know what it is you're doing. And then you start developing, the way I usually work is I start developing my story to, to go with the quest, and I develop my story and, and the map or the world sort of synonymously, and the puzzles fit into the story, and you work those in one by one. Excellent. I was hoping that was exactly what you would say. Of course, somebody else wants to talk to you, so let's uh, take a caller right now. Hello? You're Hello? on the line with Roberta and Mark. Hey. Hi, who's it? Hey. Um, this is um, Keith. Keith, hi, Keith. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, I'm fine. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm a great fan. I have been since I was like five or so, whenever your first game came out. Oh, well, thank you very much. And um, uh, my question is really not with the game because I'm really far in it. And You are far in it? Yeah, I'm, oh. well, I'm on the Baron level right now. Great. And it's great. It's a great game. It's Unlike anything I've ever played before. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. But um, I just wanted to um, know: Are you ever planning on making a Phantasmagoria three? Because Phantasmagoria has been my favorite game of all time. Oh, that is okay. Uh, well, good. I'm glad you like it because I that's that's my favorite game too. As you know, when we did that last poll. Yeah. Um, boy, Phantasmagoria three. I think uh, I think that's a Sierra decision. I mean, it's uh, we'll have to see what what Sierra what Sierra thinks. Um, that's all I can say. Um, right, Sierra? <laughs> Tell them you like it. Tell them that they, you'd like it. What, what, Actually, what? in a few more minutes, uh, we're going to uh, give everyone a chance to tell Sierra what they think because we're going to uh, take a poll uh, as far as which series uh, Sierra should begin the development uh, on next. But uh, right now, let's take another caller. All right, thank you. Thank you. You're on the line with Roberta and Mark. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm Roberta Williams and Mark Siebert. No, uh, my name is K K N E I or Kevin, and I just want a signed copy of the mask. Are you, are you Kevin? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hi, Kevin. Yes, yeah, so it's a great honor. You know, I'm going to air seal it and, you know, just keep it for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, and I have, like, two small questions, if you two wouldn't mind asking. No problem. Yeah, and I've been, like, following development, like, for almost three years now, ever, you know, ever since King's Quest Seven came out. And one of the characters I saw in the older version of the game was a red cap goblin. And he was a pretty cool character, which is in design and stuff. So oh. I was wondering, whatever happened to him? Because I didn't see him in the newer version of the game. Yeah, what happened, what happened to him? He, yeah, he tried to. Uh, yeah, I think he, he kind of, he was there, and then he wasn't there, and then he was there, and then he wasn't there. And then his last iteration, um, which also didn't survive, the little red cap goblin turned into a leprechaun. 
<laughs> that uh, was supposed to be in the uh, Castle Keep ruins in Daventry, and at the very last minute, that also died out, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, so he kind of went through several different versions before we finally decided we weren't going to have him. Yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, I had another question. I think that originally, if I understand correctly, you're going to have this all as one giant world where you have explored in, uh, in the game, and now it's like separated into seven different worlds. And I sort of like that idea better, but I was wondering uh, what, cha- what made you change your mind about that. One big world. Do you remember that, Mark? Um, yeah, probably. Um, if we had ever talked about making it one big world, the thing that really um, held us back from doing it was uh, the fact that the, the game is actually palletized. Every every level is um, uh, based on a pallet, so we've got uh, you know uh, the colors in Daventry would uh, be. Uh, hurt by the colors in the barrens, which are kind of orange and all that, and then you have the ice world that's all blue. So each world kind of have a, has its own little, uh, you know, kind of look and feel, which made it a lot easier for us to do uh, by separating them out. Yeah, I like this new style a lot better too. So. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just if, if you explore one big world, it, it probably would start getting boring after a while. Um, I've always felt that the more places and different types of places you can explore is always more fun in the long run. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. Bye. Right, I believe we have uh, one more caller here before we go to the poll. So uh, you're on the air with uh, Roberta and Mark. Hi, Roberta. How are you? Hi. I'm fine. How are you? <clears throat> Excuse me. This is Randy from the Just Adventure site. Hi, Randy. It's nice Hi, to Hi, Mark. Hi, John. Hi. Hi, Randy. Hi, John. I met you last month at the Blackstone party. I know you probably don't remember, but the party in San Jose. Sure enough. A lot of fun. Um, I have a tough question for you, Roberta, and it's probably for everybody to answer, and it concerns the, the marketing methods used for today's adventure games. Um I, I think your game has potential to sell a million copies. I really do. Oh, great. <laughs> but um, I'm, I have a theory that the marketing methods are so outdated, for, especially for the adventure games, for games like Mask of Attorney, some other companies' games. I went to the theater the other day with my kids, and we saw a commercial for Zelda before the Rugrats movie. Uh-huh. You turn Saturday morning TV on, you see commercials for Odd World, you see commercials for all these other games that aren't half as good as Mask of Eternity. Yeah, they're going to outsell Mask Attorney just for that simple fact. It seems like the uh, companies are stuck in a um, mindset where they think the only place they could advertise or game, you know, excellent magazines like <clears throat> Computer Gaming World um, and so many other magazines out there, but they seem they seem to be scared to go outside those boundaries to try different places to advertise. And um, so you're you're talking about like TV. Well, no, not just TV, not TV, t- radio. Uh-huh. When my kids saw the back of the box from Ask of Attorney, the first thing they said was, that, that looks like Zelda. Oh. I mean, you have, and it's an action game. If you put uh-huh. commercials on television, if you, if you advertise on some fantasy websites, some fantasy groups, um, you know, some J- uh, J.R.R. Tolkien fan clubs. Well, I, I can't, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, I don't know about TV. I mean, to, uh, to advertise on television is... It's pretty expensive, and you have to make sure that there that the customer base is out there before you would commit those kinds of dollars. And um, and when you're talking about something like Zelda, which is on the uh, the Sony PlayStation, um, you, at least I think it's the Sony PlayStation, isn't it? Or That's the um, Nintendo. 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 Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> see what I know. Uh, okay, <laughs> Nintendo. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway. Uh, the customer base is much larger. I mean, um, as much as we love computers and like to think that there's a lot of people with computers out there playing games, I mean, let's face it, there's a lot more people that are playing games on Nintendos and Sony Playstations. The customer base is much, much, much larger. So uh, right there, marketing dollars for TV is going to be limited. However, I do agree with you that... Um, and. Uh, not to disparage Sierra's marketing, I think they're a wonderful group, absolutely wonderful. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, radio is certainly a place to look, um, and uh, perhaps being a little more creative with the internet. Yeah, maybe on Talkspot, uh, do some advertising on Talkspot. Advertising on Talkspot is <laughs> great it's idea. It's not a dual-edged sword, almost. I mean, if you if you to catch twenty-two, if you if you would put the money into the advertising, you'd also draw the new customers and probably make the advertising worthwhile. 
actually the uh, the user base on on PCs is, is much smaller, and so you don't really get your ad dollars worth when you go to like a uh, like a television uh, for the PC games uh, because uh, the PC games push the edge of the envelope technologically all the time, and they're continually uh, getting new iterations. And so basically, that uh, people that can buy a Mask of Eternity and get the best experience uh, is significantly smaller uh, than the people that can buy a Zelda. And That's get true. Yeah, right, but we're also seeing commercials on television offer games like Rainbow Six, which is a PC gate uh, based game, which is based on a Tom Clancy novel, if I remember correctly. Well, sure, uh, and uh, it doesn't really push the technology as far, and also they have that huge uh, uh, base of Tom Clancy people that they're drawing off of. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. right, they're gonna, there's going to be more. But uh, you also have to consider the audience. More people who play console games are going to be watching television than people who play PC games. Because uh, let's face it, a lot of the PC people are hanging out uh, on the internet uh, as opposed to uh, watching television these days. Right, days. right. That, I do, I do think that that television is the wrong place to go at this point in time for games like ours. Uh, the demographics just aren't really there at this point in time. Um, but um, I do think the Internet, though, is definitely a place that uh, marketing should be looking at a little more closely. I also okay. love to see the crossover ads in fantasy novels and, and such like. And we have uh, another caller here before we go up with the poll. Right, thank so, you. Uh, thank you, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Okay, next call. You're on the line with uh, Roberta and Mark. Hi, this is Brian. Hey, Hi, Brian. Um, I've played the games ever since I was five years old, and um, I'm just worried that... Uh, if King's Quest Eight isn't a isn't a hit, that you won't be making a number nine. Are there any plans to make a nine? Well, uh, I think there's always a uh, chance, or you know, plans in the works for another King's Quest, especially if the you know, especially if one's popular. I mean, um, as long as King's Quest sells, as long as people like it, as long as people ask for it, what else could Sierra do? And would you think about using like a text parser or anything for King's Quest Nine, like in Starship Titanic or something like that? Would Would you like that? I'd like that a lot. I thought it might make a might make it a little more challenging and more interesting. And And how well do you think that would sell? In all in in reality, it might sell good if you um if you had the ability to talk to people by typing in stuff. You You think so? I do. You think the average person out there would would want to do that? I think so. Okay, well, we'll take it under advisement. Okay, so and I um, also had a question for Mark. Okay. I was just wondering if um, if the petitions and stuff are helping any for Space Quest 7? Well, you know, I've seen um, a lot of people ask about Space Quest 7. Um, I've seen that, too. Uh, yeah, I, I'm really not sure um, what's going on with it, but um, uh, the right place to uh, send those, I guess, um, would be right where you're sending them. Actually, uh, I, I'm with you. I would like Sierra to do a Space Quest 7. I, I mean, would, too. Space Quest was uh, was one of my favorite um, series of Sierra, and it, and, it, and it just cries out for 3D. There's so much they could do with it. Well, maybe with the new Star Wars movie coming out you know, this next year, there, it would be a kind of resurgence to get that space humor going. Well, I tell you, it'd be great if Sierra, you know, if, there's, if Sierra's listening... Uh, if there's anybody out there listening from Sierra, uh, jot this down, this little note, because I think this would be, I think this would be big. If there was a way that they could get the two guys from Andromeda together to do again, a, again <laughs> to do a 3D uh, space quest, I think that would be huge. It'd be great. There would be people that would be lining up in order to uh, to buy it. And uh, I don't know, I don't know where those two guys are right now, but both of them, or at least one of them, may still work for Sierra. I think one Somewhere. of them is at Roberta Land. One of them is at Roberta Land. Okay, but uh, that's just a thought. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye. Okay, we're going to take a break right now, and uh, we're going to be uh, back in a few minutes, and uh, we'll give you a chance to uh, vote on a poll, and uh, we'll also give you some more chances to win a signed copy of Mask of Eternity. So uh, let's uh, bring up the music and go to a break right now.
when you buy something, you definitely have to think about how much it costs. But do you ever think about how much it's going to cost you down the road? For example, let's say you buy a dog. First, you have to consider the constant cost of dog food and the vet bills and the rental charges for that rug shampooer and the lawyer's fee for that policeman's leg and, well, you get the idea. You know, a car is another thing that can really cost you a lot over the years, unless you buy a Saturn. The 98 IntelliChoice Complete Car Cost Guide found Saturn offers the lowest cost of ownership for sedans in the compact class, which means when you take the cost of a sedan and add on five years' worth of gas insurance and maintenance, a Saturn is cheaper to own than most cars. Who knows? Might even be cheaper to own than a dog. Hey, cut that out, or I'll call your psychotherapist. Find out how inexpensive it is to own a Saturn at your local Saturn retailer or call 1-800-522-5000. 1-800-522-5000. Texaco Star Mart presents Great Moments in Convenience Store History. During a snack run in spring of 1985, Leonard Fusel has an experience that alters the course of history. Here's your change. Now go away, candy boy. This gives Leonard an idea. Gosh, why can't convenience stores have friendly salespeople? Leonard takes his radical idea to Star Mart. They set out to build the perfect convenience store associate. Prototypes are tested, perfecting features like enthusiasm, helpfulness, and hygiene. Finally, success. Welcome to Star Mart. Can I help you? People everywhere marvel at the spectacle of excellence. Here's your change, Leonard. Love the windbreaker. Thanks, Star Mart lady. Through it all, Star Mart never stops challenging itself to be the best. For example, Ben and Jerry's bar, 149. Four packs of Coke, 279. And a three and a half ounce bag of Doritos with a Pepsi Big Slam, just 198. At your participating Star Mart, while supplies last, prices may vary. Star Mart invents friendly salespeople for you. Mexico, a world of energy. Athletes have their all-star teams. Actors get their statues. But how about a little something for the guys who build this country every day? The builders, the contractors, the tradesmen. I'm thinking of a place up on a hill. Call it the Pro Builders Hall of Fame. Built like a brick house where the best of the best are enshrined. The fastest framers, the tightest trimmers, the richest plumbers. How about a woodworker's wing where you could touch the actual sawdust spewed out by the masters? Autographs would be signed, of course, with a router. Now, a place like this would need a sponsor. And who better than Bosch Power Tools? The inventors of the jigsaw, the big daddy of hammer drills, the blue machines that let you walk onto a new job site and make a statement loud and bold that says, I am not a hack, without having to utter a word. There should be a place like this. Just a thought from Bosch Power Tools, engineered for performance. Hi, this is Johnny Wilson, the editor-in-chief of Computer Gaming World magazine, and uh, I've had the privilege of talking with Mark Siebert, the uh, producer and co-conspirator on King's Quest Mask of Eternity, and Roberta Williams, the designer of all the King's Quest games and uh, co-conspirator on King's Quest Mask of Eternity. It's uh, good to be with you guys, and uh, some of these uh, Easter eggs have been uh, kind of exciting that you've talked about. I noticed that uh, during the break, uh, P. Caposo had uh, some kind of a question um, uh, about the swamp. Uh, do you, are there any uh, Easter eggs out there in the swamp? Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any Easter eggs in the swamp. No Easter eggs in the swamp. Hmm. Oh, my, that must be the only uh, egg-free section uh, in the game. <laughs> egg-free, yeah. Um... So, the, so the artists and the programmers just didn't get creative there, huh? Uh, well, no, we, we've got we've got a few Easter eggs, but uh, not but in not the swamp. But not in the swamp. <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, there's. I mean, there is sort of in the in the sense that there's uh, a little bit of an obscure puzzle there with the uh, the unicorn horn. Uh, but I don't want to, you know, say too much. Right. Uh, um, okay. Well, we could if we warned them. We, we could warn them. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're, I'm warning. I'm warning. Okay, so, just warning. So let's uh, take about 20 seconds on the unicorn horn puzzle. 20 seconds on the unicorn horn. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, yeah, uh, if you had ran into the into this so-called ugly beast in Daventry, you would have found out that the uh, that the ugly beast was a unicorn in disguise, who needs her horn back in order to turn back into a unicorn, and she mentions a swamp witch that has stolen it. 
So when you eventually get yourself to the swamp, then um, you and, and get into the swamp witch's castle, then you'll see this ugly dead monster lying on her table, and uh, and nearby is a is a book on a pedestal. And if you click on the book or if you read the book, then you'll see a recipe for goblin tartare. And uh, and that mentions a unicorn horn as part of the recipe. And if you look closer at this dead goblin, then you'll see something sticking out of his heart. That <laughs> looks a little bit like a unicorn horn. Okay, excellent. Okay, if you're back with us now, we uh, have an opportunity to do the monster poll, the chance to vote for your favorite monsters, and then Roberta and Mark are going to tell us their favorite monsters. Right now you have a choice between the Shadow Bane, the Skeleton Commander, the Swamp Witch, Thork, Lord of the Frost Orcs, and Lucrito. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and vote on our favorite monsters. Okay, so... Um, are there uh, so are Easter we able eggs to do in Daventry we haven't talked about yet? Easter eggs in Daventry? Yeah. Uh, well, we've got some Easter eggs in uh, Dead City. In the uh, Dimension of the Dead? Yeah. Well, actually, well, well, there was one that we were talking about yesterday, Mark and I, and I wasn't quite sure as to whether that was really an Easter egg or not. Isn't there a place where there's a, a sloping hillside uh, to on the east side of the map, where oh, you could, yes. you could uh, walk up it. It's it's an almost unclimbable hill, I think, and you can manage to make your way up it, and then you find yourself on the outside of the map, ah. and can actually wander around the outside of the map of Daventry. Is that is that correct, Mark? That's right. Yeah, and there's uh, actually a picture of uh, one of the artist's wife. I think is out one there. of the artist's wife. <laughs> So if anybody ever sees that, sees this picture and wonder who that woman is, then it's it's just some obscure picture of one of the artist's wives. Yes, because you're having an out of Daventry experience. <laughs> yeah, it's just I mean it's an Easter egg. I mean it's not supposed to be there. So, so there you go. That's right. Well, um, the monster poll is supposed to be going on right now, but uh, I'm not seeing it. Is I'm else? not seeing it either. I think uh, yeah, I think some we're, we are experiencing technical difficulties. Okay. Well, obviously the Iraqis are jamming our signal, and uh, uh, so we need to move on with something else. So exa- either that or it's y- Y2K. I don't know. Yeah. Starting early. <laughs> <laughs> Starting very early. Uh, well, um, let's uh, you know give uh, people a chance to win another signed copy of uh, King's Quest: Mask of Eternity, uh, because uh, we have another King's Quest trivia question, and uh, oh, this time. Once again, let's take the fourth caller here. The fourth caller at uh, 800-485-1923, and the trivia question is, what did Prince Alexander need in order to enter the realm of the dead? Don't type this in the chat. Just call, and this will be uh, caller number four will get the chance to uh, get on the line and to, to win this. What did Prince Alexander need in order to enter the realm of the dead? And what is that number again? That is 800-485-1923, and your uh, multiple choices are a gold coin, a ticket, a lit candle, a magic wand, a silver flute, or some food. So is that a gold coin, a ticket, a lit candle, a magic wand, a silver flute, or some food? And? And we're waiting for a call. We're waiting. Okay. There's, we may have... We're looking for that caller. We're number looking four. for that caller number four. Anybody got the answer? What were the what were the uh, the choices again? Ah, uh, you're on the line with uh, Roberta and Mark. What's the answer? Silver flute. Yeah. Um, okay. The answer to the question, I believe, is he needed he needed the horse to actually get in there. And we're waiting for a caller. Um, yeah, he needed he needed a horse. Oh, uh, could you turn down your computer a little bit? Oh yeah, hang on just a minute. Please do. And uh, who is this? Yeah, who? This is Brandon Cross. Brandon. Brandon. Okay. And the question was, uh, and there there wasn't a horse in the uh, choices. It was, uh, what did Prince Alexander well, what, 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 need what, 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 in order to enter the realm of the dead? Again. And we're going to give you the choices again. It was okay. a gold coin, a ticket, a lit candle, a magic wand, a silver flute, or some food. It was a silver flute. A silver flute? I'm sorry. That's not right. Well, no, that's not the answer. Okay. But uh, you're going to have some more chances before this show and the next show are over. Great. Thank Did you have a question for Roberta while you were on the line? Uh, no, actually, I don't. Well, actually, yeah, maybe. Um, 
I'm, I haven't played King's Quest six, I mean, not six, um, eight yet, but did it follow the kind of format that King's Quest um, six did, where you, if you completed a puzzle, I mean, if you could not complete a puzzle, you could go on, like in King's Quest six, you know, you weren't stuck at a puzzle the entire time. Um, did King's Quest eight, Mask of Eternity, follow that kind of format? So, it, um, I, I guess I'm qu not quite sure. Yeah, what you're saying. I, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, okay. You're asking uh, if uh, you get stuck on a puzzle, uh, can you go other places and do other things and then yeah. come back? And yeah, it, you you can. It, it's uh, it's not. Oh, it's uh, not as linear as as. Yeah. Yeah, it's right. not specifically linear. Um, That's but, what really made King's Quest six much much more interesting than five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Essentially, you need to uh, complete a, a level uh, before you can go to the next level. Well, you don't need to to complete it. You need to do. There's a minimum amount that you need to do yeah. in levels. Yeah, exactly. And then before you go to the next one. So in that sense, that there there is a little bit more linearity with with um, King's Quest Eight than with Six. Uh, Six was more deliberately designed because of the idea of the islands, um, with one central island, and you could sort of jump around to the different islands. It was deliberately designed that way, um, whereas uh, this game is more of a, a quest or a journey. This is really a journey, um, the same as King's Quest V was more like a journey. And uh, so, so there is a little more linearity. However, um, there's just a minimum amount that you need to do in each world to get onto the next one, but there's a lot of subquests, and, and, and coming back to worlds and finishing up the subquests is, is real, pretty easy to do. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'll be really excited to play the game when I buy it. Oh, great. All right. Thanks. Sure. Bye. Bye. Okay. Well, let's take another caller. That's someone else on the line with Roberta and Mark. Hello. This is the winner. Hello. Oh, is this uh, MFU? Uh, this is BBK. Oh, BBK. Yeah. Okay. All right, BBK. Uh, <laughs> what did Prince Alexander need in order to enter the realm of the dead? Uh, the ticket. You're right. Exactly. He had a bunch of tickets. He needed he a ticket. ticket. Yeah, he needed a ticket. It's been so long playing those games, I've almost forgot a lot of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. <laughs> my son has taken up uh, playing a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, in doing these shows, I've I've sort of had to go back and gather up materials and and look into my my memory and try to remember some of this stuff too. I was, oh, yeah. I was afraid I'm, people I'm are going to ask me puzzles and I wasn't going to know the answer to some of these old games. Right. Some of the old games were from uh, the color computer days. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And then the time when they even said they were not going to have five and a quarter discs uh, in the box now, only three and a half. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, boy. <laughs> uh-huh. And then uh, then I all, I go all the way back to Apple II. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's... Uh, so and that's not real long, not a long time ago. Well, not... No, it's not that long. No. <laughs> <laughs> but in computer, in the computer world, it's it's, it's ancient, even though in, maybe that's in right. the real world, it's not that old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thanks a lot, BBK. Thanks. And uh, right now, we're going to try once again to go back to the monster pool. So uh, it should be popping up screens momentarily. Let's All cross right, our fingers. Uh, I, I still see Roberta there looking intense. Oh, yeah, oh am I looking intense? I don't want to look like that. <laughs> you, you, I got the camera on you, Roberta. Oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> it's not the most flattering camera in the world, I have to tell you guys. Uh, <laughs> okay, the poll is actually up. Look, there it is. I don't see it yet. You don't? <laughs> no. Oh, I think you... Oh, I think my computer is down. Uh, They're coming. To... They're coming. But you guys go right ahead and have fun. Oh, uh, well, you are already having you? fun. You go, right, <laughs> you go ahead and vote for me, Mark. Yeah, you know. So how's it going with the poll? Looks like the Swamp Witch is about 30%, and uh, looks like uh, Lacrito has uh, 20, Skeleton Commander is at 30, and uh, Thork, the Lord of the Frost Orcs, is 10%, so I guess that novel isn't a good idea after all. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like him. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can name, contaminate though. the poll. Well, you know, wh what's your favorite character in the game, Mark? It doesn't have to be a monster. Let's see, what is your favorite character in the whole game? I like the Sylph. She she's fun and there's some fun things you can do with her that um, uh, I think we'll get to in the Easter egg section later. <laughs> oh, good, good. That'll be fun. Okay, Roberta, let's contaminate the poll. What's your favorite monster in the game? Well, I like Lucrito. 
I always uh, like the big bad guy. <laughs> the, you know, the big bad guy always has a lot. Even though you don't see him till the very end, just in planning the game and on, in writing the game and writing your story, I mean, the big bad guy is what it's all about, and you just can't wait to get him. <laughs> so what? I like I like Lucredo is oh, my I'm, favorite. You were monster. asking me what monster I like. Well, no, I, I asked you the character because oh, I didn't okay. want to contaminate the poll until oh, okay. I wanted to ask yeah. I to... yeah, no, I wouldn't say Lucredo is my favorite character, but he's my favorite bad guy. Well, that that's very cool. Uh, so, speaking of Easter eggs, let's uh, let's move back into the in Easter eggs and let's uh, talk about some Easter eggs in the dimension of death. And, uh, and so, uh, Mark, you were just about to tell us one before we went to break. Uh, well, yeah, I was talking about the uh, the sylph. Um, she's kind of a fun character, and uh, at the recording session down in L.A. Um, uh, as we were uh, recording the lines for Connor and the sylph, they um, were getting uh, levels. And they kind of went off on this uh, wonderful little uh, comic routine that they made up kind of impromptu uh, out of our dialogue. And it was just uh, too good to uh, pass up. So uh, if you uh, if you go to the ice world and uh, actually in the barrens, uh, get the uh, scepter uh, that use, uh, runs the dragon, you can bring it back to um, uh, the dimension of death and you, you can click it on her to get little snippets of this. Uh, wonderful little impromptu uh, recording they did. Okay. Well, yeah, that's... I haven't even heard that. I'm going to have to go back in and do that. <laughs> you know, now I'm worried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very worried. There was some good stuff there in the recording session. Some good stuff? Yeah. Well, <laughs> some scary interesting stuff. stuff. Yeah. Scary stuff and interesting stuff. Well, you know, the kind of person that would figure out that scepter thing would be the person who is perceptive enough not to be offended, right? Uh, exactly. Well, right. At least we hope. We hope. <laughs> we hope. We hope it's not some five-year-old kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. No, it's not that bad. Well, what's your favorite uh, Easter egg in the dimension of death? Mark? That one. Oh, I, I think that that's it. We, we do have uh, another one that was kind of an inside uh, little Easter egg. Um, you know, those crazy little boxes that uh, sit on the desk and, and uh, they kind of go off and go, let me out of here, let me out of here. Um, well, one of the guys had one of these uh, crazy things and was driving everybody nuts. And um, we thought it would be funny to make uh, one of the boxes in the dimension of death do that. Um, so if uh, when you uh, go into the dimension of death, there's a uh, dead uh, character on, on the ground there and he's surrounded by boxes. And one of the boxes on the uh, east side of him, if you click on it 25 times, will uh, do that little box thing. Well, wasn't there one, though, where you um, – oh, God, what, what was that? Was it, I thought that was with the box – that you did that, but then you had to go over to the wall and click on the right tile, uh, that or is that the, another... That was in uh, the ice world. Oh, okay. Well, you have to wait till Monday for that one. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> when you talk about the frozen reaches. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just uh, we'll tease him and let him uh, know that there's a special character from Larry that shows up. If, in... but, but we're not going to tell you how to okay, do it until uh, Monday. Forget, yeah, forget it. Forget <laughs> it. You have to wait. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we'd like uh, right now for uh, you to call in if you have uh, any questions about uh, either the Daventry section or the Dimension of Death section, and to call in at 1-800-485-1923. Uh, and while we're uh, you know waiting for that, we're going to be going soon to another poll, but it looks uh, like the Swamp Witch won uh, that first poll. Uh, what do you think about that? I think the Swamp Witch, yeah, she's she's, she's a fun pretty, character. She's pretty, she's pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, if you uh, when you kill her, if you if you really look at it closely, it, it's uh, you, you don't see it always depending on the way the camera is. But she has a, a really interesting death animation that uh, uh, you might want to save your game before you you finish her off because it's kind of cool. You might want to watch it a couple of times. Yeah, actually, I think uh, if uh, we could go back into the design, I think I would uh, ha I would advocate doing more with her. I think she was a much more fun character that uh, I think I would have liked to have been able to see her inside her castle and and do some, some things with her in there, which we ha had originally planned, but it's just one of those things. Like every design. That, it yeah, I know. I, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, it's just always painful to see the uh, the leftover design that gets left on the, as they say, the cutting, cutting room floor. floor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you just think about that. But yeah, the Swamp Witch is a real fun. Exactly. We're going to, um, before we uh, go to break, we're going to uh, do one more trivia question here, and uh, we're going to, the number to call is 485-1923. That's 1-800-485-1923.
And uh, the question is this, and we're going to take the third caller. Why did Princess Rosella jump into the magical pond? Why did Princess Rosella jump into the magical pond? To catch a frog? To find a castle? To fetch a golden ball? To save her mother? To go swimming? Or to escape a monster? Hmm. So we're going to take the uh, third caller here. Hmm. Now, could this be Princess Rosella from King's Quest Four or King's Quest Seven? Well, it could be either one, couldn't it? It could be. It could be. I'm be- I'm betting it's from King's Quest Seven. You think so? Uh, yeah. Okay. So what were those? Oh, there we go. Okay, to catch a frog, to find a castle, to fetch a golden ball, to save her mother, to go swimming, to escape a monster. Callers? You didn't give us any of those all of the above answers there. And all uh, all of the above. She, okay. she jumped we're, in we're for looking, every We're night. looking for the third caller here. Yeah, actually. So um, he wants a free copy of, of King's Quest Mask of Eternity. That's right. Uh-oh. Maybe. Maybe. Do we have a third caller yet? Maybe. I'm not sure. If not, we have somebody in South Africa who's already put the right answer up there and uh, has been trying pretty hard all the time. It goes by the name of uh, MFU. And I I think maybe what we ought to do is just uh, go ahead and and let him have it. He said it was to find a castle. I think that's that's absolutely right. That's right. So congratulations to uh, MFU in uh, South Africa. Uh, You're the winner of a uh, signed copy of uh, King's Quest Mask of Eternity. Great. Congratulations. Uh, that's okay. And yeah. uh, oh, now yeah, we have a caller, and uh, because we were waiting so long for the caller, we went with that one. But guess what? We oh. have another question. Oh, okay. So you're on the line with uh, Roberta and Mark. Hello. Hello. We have another question. So uh, we hope you can get this one too. We want to know what is the name of Adrian's and Don's cat in Phantasmagoria. And don't and don't answer yet until don't we. Uh, yet, but it could either be Spaz, Tigger, Fluffy, Samson, Boots, or Sadie. You notice socks is not on the list. It's yeah, Spaz, I, I yeah, socks <laughs> almost uh, got on uh, the list. Spaz, Tigger, Fluffy, <laughs> Samson, Boots, and Sadie. Spaz. What do you say? Spaz. Spaz, you've just won. I'm happy of the Mask of Eternity. So uh, <laughs> we're going to play some music and go to break, and we'll be right back. If you've got questions for Roberta or Mark, please call at 8- 485-193. <laughs> You're accountants with one of the big six firms. We're the bean supreme counters. bean counters. <laughs> we take care of the beans. <laughs> you consider yourself on the cutting edge of accounting. We do. We've got better beans. <laughs> no, we're just more into virtual beans than anybody else. Which is why you use IBM ThinkPads. Our in-house software is so complex that if we didn't have IBM ThinkPads, we would be unable to function. Going to the IBM ThinkPad was, was a no-brainer. Power and speed for the fastest applications. A big screen, the Intel Pentium processor with MMX technology, uh, a neat keyboard. I've dropped all kinds of sesame seeds down in there, and mine hasn't missed a beat. The fact that you can now get a ThinkPad 380 for the same price as lesser notebooks is also nice. We are a CPA firm, after all. <laughs> so uh, buying ThinkPads is not a lavish gesture. <laughs> the accountants to the accountants do not believe in lavish gestures. Estimated reseller prices start at $15.99. And now until June 30th, you can get an extra $200 off on select models. Call 1-800-IBM-COR-P for the reseller near you. ThinkPad notebooks feature the Intel Pentium processor with MMX technology. This is a test of the stereophonic quality of your hi-fi. In front of me, I have a six-pack of Bud Light Long Neck Bottles. The left front bottle. The left rear bottle. The right front bottle. The right rear bottle. Center. Right front. Left rear. Left front. Right rear. Center. And now, in succession. And now, a 12-pack. This 
has been a test of your high fun. Brought to you by Bud Light Beer. In long neck bottles, of course. And Hyderbush St. Louis, Missouri. The next generation of computer adventure games is here. Master storyteller Roberta Williams brings her best-selling King's Quest series into the next millennium with King's Quest, Mask of Eternity. This revolutionary blend of 3D action and a spellbinding mythical story is in stores now. King's Quest, Mask of Eternity takes you back to the familiar world of Daventry, where darkness now stalks the land. Experience seven worlds of fantastical gameplay and intricate puzzles through either a first or third person perspective as you wander through the 3D world of King's Quest for the first time. Enter this deep and compelling tale of an eternal champion's struggle to restore the Mask of Eternity and save the Kingdom of Daventry. Succeed, and honor and glory will be yours. Fail, and the forces of evil will reign supreme for eternity. Hello, Johnny Wilson, Editor-in-Chief of Computer Gaming World Magazine, and I'm here with uh, Roberta Williams and Mark Siebert, uh, the co-designers of King's Quest Mask of Eternity. And we're going to have a lot of fun this uh, last segment because uh, we're going to uh, uh, try a poll where you get to be a software executive and tell Sierra what you think they should uh, work on next. And uh, we're going to be able to uh, hear, if all goes well, uh, a little bit of uh, Mark Siebert's uh, music uh, from uh, King's Quest Mask of Eternity. And uh, we're going to be uh, talking to some uh, callers online right now. So you can participate in the poll right now. Uh, should Sierra be again developing on Space Quest, Leisure Suit Larry, Phantaz, King's Quest, or Laura Bow? Right now we have a, a caller on the line. So you're on the line with uh, Roberta and Mark. Hello. Hi. Um, this actually is more of a question for Mark, I would guess. But uh, you guys have talked a lot about the design and what goes into like creating the world and the graphics design and stuff like that. But for me, what really makes the world more personable and more, I don't know, kind of complete is the music. And I was just kind of wondering if the music is music and sound effects if they're done like kind of beforehand and like or. If, like it's the last thing that's done after you got, kind of have a feel for the story and stuff. Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, one of the last things that's done. Uh, the this, this story, uh, you know, gets written first, and then the the design gets built around the story. Uh, we get the graphics going, and once we get the graphics kind of going, uh, you know, you start looking at the images and kind of see what uh, you know is appropriate. Okay, cool. Is there any uh, um, any place where um, like you can? Uh, obtain like copies of the the music because a lot of the music is just would be fun to listen to, like outside of the game. I know there's a CD available at one time. Um, yeah, there's. There, I'd say that, um, if you wanted to get the music for um, King's Quest, um, we have a, a CD that we've worked on, and you, you would need to petition right along with. Uh, uh, Space Quest 7. <laughs> uh, the CD has actually been uh, recorded and it's just waiting to be pressed and uh, somebody in uh, management needs to decide they want to do it. So send your really? petition. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that's, yeah, at this point, that's all that Mark and I can really do is just say, you know, you guys, it, it's all in your hands. It's up to it's up to the fans as to what they want. And, and the way you need to, to do it is to let Sierra know as much as you can. All right. I'll drop an email off to him then. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, right now it looks like uh, Sierra needs to know that uh, the fans particularly want the uh, Laura Bow to be the next uh, product I by a slight noticed, margin. I am. I really. I'm. I'm surprised wow, about that. that. Um, I. Uh, I I'm mystified. I mean, Laura Bow. Is, I mean, it's a great series. I. But it's 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 old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised anybody remembers it. <laughs> uh, well, I guess she's just an unforgettable character. So we have uh, another caller on the line. So. Uh, Moment, you're on the line with uh, Roberta and Mark. Hello. Hello. Hi. Who's this? This is Chad. Hi, Chad. Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to say that um, you're. I I love you. Oh. you I love your games. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. First, first game I played was uh, King's Quest uh, Four. Oh, that, that's a long time ago. Yes, and uh, I loved it. Uh huh. And I've been playing all your games, and. Um, I was wondering, do you did you think that 
the King's Quest 8 needed to move to 3D and, or in order for it to forget, progress? In, in, or do you think it would have been as successful or would it, it would have worked uh, as a non-3D game? Have you, have you played it? Let me ask you a question first and then I'll answer. H have you played King's Quest Mask of Eternity yet? Uh, I played the demo and I just received it in the mail today. Okay. I'm getting ready to play it. Okay. Um, well, my experience, and I, I think Mark should also answer this question. I think it's a really good question. My experience in playing this particular game is um, after you have played at least half the game and you really start getting used to it and uh, used to the interface and, and, and um, driving Connor around and the camera, it just begins to feel so immersive to me, to me, much more immersive than even the older games. And, uh, you know, I will acknowledge that we probably could have done a better job in, you know, many ways, but... Um, it's the first of a new type of adventure game for, certainly for Sierra, and, you know, just learning how to design in 3D. And I just think that, uh, you know, there's some things we did right and some things we did wrong. But overall, to me, the exploration and uh, immersiveness of 3D is just so much more. I just, I don't think I personally could go back to, to 2D. What do you think, Mark? Uh, 3D's here to stay. I, I like it. It's really fun. Uh, yeah, it gets you more involved in the game. I think so. I, I think so. And the worlds uh, are going to have the capability of being able to feel much more real. And as the technology improves and as the computing power of computers improves, it's just going to get better and better. But uh, you need to play a little, you know, through it and get a little further into it. And I think uh, you'll agree. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Super. Uh, well, one last question for you for tonight. Next week uh, on Monday night, uh, we're going to be on from 5 to 7, 10, and we're going to be uh, talking about uh, the other three parts of the world and asking those difficult questions like, why only five pieces of the mask instead of uh, seven? And uh, and what did learn end up on the uh, cutting room floor? And what are the Easter eggs in those last three worlds? But uh, meanwhile, uh, I just wanted to know... Uh, did uh, you guys, uh, Roberta and Mark, uh, script everything together, or did uh, you trade off my turn, your turn? Oh, gosh. I think uh, the, the first two designs, there was three designs for, for Mask of Eternity, and the first one, first two, um, I, as far as the design, the, just pretty much straight design, I did um, for the most part myself. Uh, those two... Um, actually, parts of the first design made it into the second design, and then um, neither one of those exactly worked right. So, um, and we were running up against a, tie, a, a, a time deadline. So ah, Mark, we are running up against the time deadline here too. Oh. So we're going to pick up there next week. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, so we'll leave people in suspense. <laughs> so we'll continue that story on Monday, and I just want to tell everybody to come back on Monday because we're going to be talking about the next five worlds. So it's going to be a huge Mask of Eternity discussion on Monday. So they want to make sure they're back. Excellent. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you for Mark being with us. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. All right. This Thanks, is Johnny, Johnny Wilson from Computer Gaming World Magazine. Thank you for being with us. And see us again Monday at 5 till 7 as we talk about the next five worlds of King's Quest Mask of Eternity with Roberta Williams and Mark Siebert.
next generation of computer adventure games is here. Master storyteller Roberta Williams brings her best-selling King's Quest series into the next millennium with King's Quest, Mask of Eternity. This revolutionary blend of 3D action and a spellbinding mythical story is in stores now. King's Quest, Mask of Eternity, takes you back to the familiar world of Daventry, where darkness now stalks the land. Experience seven worlds of fantastical gameplay and intricate puzzles through either a first or third person perspective as you wander through the 3D world of King's Quest for the first time. Enter this deep and compelling tale of an eternal champion's struggle to restore the Mask of Eternity and save the Kingdom of Daventry. Succeed, and honor and glory will be yours. Fail, and the forces of evil will reign supreme for eternity.